Is your purpose and goal in life to become rich? Listening to the trendy prosperity doctrine, you get the idea that getting wealthy is the key teaching and goal of the scriptures. Would you like to investigate the truth? Stay tuned to learn what your Bible really says. From the time of the Messiah to our modern technological age, much Bible truth has been lost. With the melding of foreign philosophies and teachings unknown to the believers of the first century, the early church began a transformation away from its Hebrew origins. The question we need to ask ourselves is, just how far did it go? Join us for the next half hour as we take you on an incredible journey of biblical understanding as we uncover the foundation of the Christian faith. Are you ready to discover the truth? A few years ago, religious bookstores were loaded with a book called The Prayer of Jabez. The book sold over 9 million copies. Factor in those sharing the book and we could be talking about 25 million readers or more. That's a huge impact. The book is about the prayer of a Jew named Jabez in 1 Chronicles chapter 4, verses 9 to 10. Verse 9 reads, And Jabez was more honorable than his brethren, and his mother called his name Jabez, saying, Because I bore him with sorrow. The next verse is the core of the prayer. And Jabez called on the Elohim of Israel, saying, Oh, that you would bless me indeed, and enlarge my coast, and that your hand might be with me, and that you would keep me from evil, and that it may not grieve me. And Elohim granted him that which he requested. What can we glean from this prayer? The Jabez book says this man's prayer is justification for everyone to pray and ask for the same things, meaning, bless me, Give me more real estate wealth. Go with and protect me. Keep me from evil doing. But there's also a twist. In place of praying for land, the literal application the, the, uh, the Bible says, the book says Jabez prays for, quote, more influence, more responsibility, and more opportunity. Is this indeed a good example for our own prayers today? Should prayer be self-seeking? To answer the question correctly, we need to look at what Yahshua the Messiah taught as constituting the right kind of prayer. Rather than focus on himself, his model prayer in Matthew 6, commonly called the Lord's Prayer, talks about us, not me. And it begins by honoring Yahweh and seeking his will on earth. Then he asks that daily needs of food be met. He petitions forgiveness and mercy not just because he asks, but bases it on how we ourselves show mercy to others and ask that we be guided away from temptation and evil. The Jabez book is all about me, with very little focus on Yahweh. Jabez's prayer was answered, not because Yahweh loved him, but because Jabez, it says, was a righteous, more honorable man. The Jabez prayer is that Yahweh will deliver him from the life that his name implies, pain and sorrow. Jabetz means pain and sorrow in Hebrew. The book of Jabez was just another in an endless series of religious fads that are filled with empty calories that spiritually lead nowhere. The fads started in the 1950s and 60s with the power of positive thinking. Then along came the seeker-sensitive fad, followed by the left-behind books and movies teaching the error-ridden rapture doctrine. Now we are inundated by the purpose-driven life. These fad movements don't support or advance the true scriptural way of life, but are indeed very effective in making their inventors quite rich. What they dish up provides a lot of empty calories, making the enthusiasts think He's really being enlightened when, in fact, he's being led down a primrose dead-end path. Religious fads work that way. They are deliberately designed to render the Bible soft and generic and non-threatening. They never deal with sin, but usually rest on a psychological premise. They don't threaten anyone's comfort zone. They never speak of changing one's life 
into the pattern of our Savior, they have one overriding purpose, to preach personal gain without responsibility or commitment to any standard. Having left the solid foundation of Scripture that says to walk in truth and obey in faith as the gold standard for centuries, now worshipers focus on using religion for personal gain. The focus is now on me, what's in it for me. The market mentality has modern religion in a vice grip. It has perverted capitalism gone amok. Make me rich, bless me with health, render me comfortable. In exchange for what, we ask? Well, simply because I ask. Simply because I am me. Simply because I have displaced the Father in my life, and now I myself am at the center of my worship. It seems each of these fads is progressively designed to require less and less of the worshiper and grant more and more guaranteed blessings. The one worshiped has been reduced to a heavenly genie. Rub the lamp and get three wishes. The prosperity teaching is one of the most pernicious of teachings, the end result of which is merely to elevate the worshiper. Notice the major doctrinal engines that drive much of theology today. The once saved, always saved doctrine says you can live life any way you please and still be guaranteed a life in eternity. Once on an airline, airline flight, I sat next to a fellow who was firmly convinced of this until I had him respond to Hebrews 6, which says it is impossible for the enlightened who fall away to be redeemed again. He admitted he had no answers to that passage, at least he was honest. The rapture doctrine says you will escape all the challenges to your faith and the trials that will soon grip the world. You can look down then from your safe haven in heaven and watch your family and friends suffer horrendously during the coming tribulation. The prosperity teaching says you can use Yahweh for personal advantage to get riches, fame, and fortune just to appease selfish desires of the here and now. Worship is shifting away from the Bible today and is focusing more on the worshiper as the center of devotion. It's all about me, not the one I worship. If you'd like to study the Bible in depth, then you need our Bible Correspondence course. Each lesson is packed with information we trust that you have never studied before, giving you a new and deeper understanding of the Word. We cover the major topics of salvation, including why we use the original names of the Father and Son, truth about the Sabbath, biblical holy days, what your Bible teaches about clean foods and the coming kingdom. And that's just for starters. The Bible course is free of charge. Request your first lesson today and begin to discover what you have been missing. Stay tuned and we'll be right back with more. Have you always wanted to know more about the Bible, but studying the Bible just seemed overwhelming? Have you always wanted to make sense of it all, but lacked the time and structure to really get a grasp of in-depth Bible understanding? If so, call Clicker right today and join our free Bible Correspondence course. This course is eye-opening, fun, and easy for anyone who desires to learn more Bible truth. With numerous lessons on many interesting topics, you will immediately begin learning truths that even those graduating from seminaries would like to know. Our course covers the true meaning of seemingly conflicting scriptures, the holy days of the Bible and their significance for us today, scripturally clean foods and the benefits of living a biblically healthy lifestyle, the origins of Christmas and the prophet Jeremiah's warning against them, and much, much more. This is graduate school for any Bible believer who wants a more in-depth and comprehensive understanding of the scriptures. We are always adding new lesson topics. Enrollment is absolutely free. Matthew 10:8 says, freely you have received, freely give. This course is a gift of understanding from the Discover the Truth TV program and Yahweh's Restoration Ministry. Really, that's great. To start receiving your Bible lessons, simply submit your request to Discover the Truth. P.O. Box 463, Holt Summit, Missouri 65043. Ask for Bible Mini Course Enrollment. You can also call in your request to area code 573-896-9248 and ask the operator for the free offer, Bible Mini Course Enrollment. 
or visit our website at www.yrm.org and click on the Bible mini course link. There you can select any three lessons at a time, absolutely free. Most pagan religions are characterized by nature-centered spirituality, a quest to develop the self, and acceptance and encouragement of diversity. A human-centered approach will always result in a toned-down view of the one worshipped, and it will always elevate the worshiper. And that's the same principle that Satan gave to Eve. You can be like the Mighty One if you stop listening to Him and listen to me. Rather than adhering to the Word as the focus of your faith, today it's multi-level marketing schemes with a promise of riches without commitment, blessings without duty. Today it's out-of-control self-indulgence and greed, epitomized by Starbucks and the vestibule and the Super Bowl on the church's giant video screen. This foolishness can only flourish when those who know better say nothing. Man-centered fads prosper when the fundamentals are forgotten or ignored. When the New Testament roots are disregarded, this is what we get. Without the Old Testament as the anchor, the New Testament is given to every kind of whimsy. In addition, what Yahshua the Messiah taught about living an acceptable life is forgotten, and a new religion about His person, not His teachings, is born instead. His purpose of bringing to earth His Father's will and applying the Father's standards to life has been lost in teachings that are unknown to the Scriptures. The prosperity doctrine is non-existent in the Bible. You will not find it. It just isn't there. The Bible promises to satisfy the needs of the faithful, not their wants. Why? Because too often what we want draws us away from our Father in Heaven, not towards Him. Until the day they entered the Promised Land, the Israelites were miraculously supplied each morning with manna. It was sustenance from Heaven. But they were commanded to gather only as much as they needed for each day. We find this in Exodus 16. In fact, if they gathered an excess, it rotted. Except, of course, on the sixth day in preparation for the weekly Sabbath when there would be no manna. So they wouldn't work to collect it. They had no promise of abundance of manna. The promise was only for daily provision. Yahweh supplies individual needs even in tough times. That does not necessarily mean the believer will never be hungry. For at times even Paul and the other apostles did get hungry. They should never have had a problem or want or lack according to the prosperity teachings. It forced them to trust Yahweh daily for provision. Yahshua, the Messiah, said, Don't be anxious about food or clothing in Matthew 6, 25-34. If the prosperity doctrine were true, He would never even bring the subject up. Rather, He reminds us that true blessings are eternal. Yahshua Himself is the true bread from heaven, the true manna. John 6, 31-32 says, Our fathers did eat manna in the desert, as it is written, He gave them bread from heaven to eat. Then Yahshua said unto them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, Moses gave you not that bread from heaven, but my Father gives you the true bread from heaven. Yahshua the Messiah is our example, and He was not a wealthy man. If the fact were widely known that He was not prosperous, He was not rich, then the prosperity doctrine would never have gotten off the ground. Read the accounts of the Savior's earthly life and see whether you see a wealthy Messiah. If wealth were the goal of the worshiper, why didn't he just turn stones into gold and precious jewels for his followers? Certainly they, above all people, deserved it. From the time Yahshua left his carpentry vocation to teach, we see him dependent on the generosity of others for food and accommodation. When He sends out His disciples, He instructs them also to rely on Yahweh through the generosity of those to whom they ministered. You can find this in Luke chapter 10, 1 to 7. None of the disciples was independently wealthy. Not one of them preached that their followers would be blessed with wealth and prosperity. Yahshua said about Himself in Luke 9, 58, 
Foxes have holes, and birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man has no place to lay his head. Our Savior practiced what he preached. He told followers to sell their possessions and give the money to the poor in Luke chapter 12. If he had had his own wealth, he would have been a hypocrite to have said this. Now look at the Apostle Peter. There is no evidence that Peter was wealthy either. When asked for a small amount by a beggar, he said in Acts 3, 6, Silver or gold I do not have, but what I have I give you. In the name of Yahshua of Nazareth, rise up and walk. Rather than promoting wealth and prosperity, our Savior actually taught against it as the goal of a believer. In what is known as the parable of the rich fool in Luke chapter 12, Yahshua gives a clear warning of the danger of seeking to be materially rich. And one of the companies said unto him, Master, speak to my brother, that he divide the inheritance with me. And he said unto him, Man, who made me a judge or a divider over you? And he said unto them, Take heed and beware of covetousness, for a man's life consists not in the abundance of the things which he possesses. And he spake a parable unto them, saying, The ground of a certain rich man brought forth plentifully. And he thought within himself, saying, What shall I do, because I have no room where to bestow my fruits? And he said, This will I do. I'll pull down my barns, and will build greater, and there I will bestow all my fruits and my goods. And I will say to my soul, Soul, you have much goods laid up for many years. Take your ease, eat, drink, and be merry. But Yahweh said unto him, You fool, this night your soul shall be required of you. For, those shall, for whose shall those things be which you have provided? So is he that lays up treasure for himself, and is not rich toward Elohim. The only wealth Yahshua encourages us to seek is spiritual wealth. For he says, Fear not, little flock, for it is your Father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. Sell what you have and give alms. Provide yourselves bags with, uh, which wax not old, a treasure in the heavens that fails not, where no thief approaches, neither moth corrupts. For where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. Well, stay tuned, and we'll be right back. At the beginning of the program, we offered our Bible mini course. We want to mention it again. You can request it free of charge. We think it is an excellent, enlightening study into the scriptures, and all you need to do is request it at the information on the screen. Well, in Luke chapter 12, verse 32, uh, this is a model that our Savior gives us, and it couldn't be more clear. In the light of this truth about we should get rid of our wealth, he says, and let others benefit, what should we make of the prosperity teachings? How do we assess the constant exhortation to ask for and to expect material blessings? Clearly, it's a doctrine of men. 
Now, blessings are indeed promised in Deuteronomy chapter 28 and elsewhere, but they are rewarded for obedience, not simply because we ask. Another common theme in prosperity teaching is that Yahshua has suffered for us, taking all our suffering upon himself. They say, therefore, that there is no need for us to suffer sickness, poverty, or any kind of deprivation. Well, there is indeed an end to every kind of suffering, but will it come in this life? The very fact that our bodies still die is proof that the end of suffering isn't here yet. It will come when we meet Yahshua when he returns to this earth. But until his return, every one of us is eventually will succumb to sickness, heart attack, stroke, cancer, accident, or some other terminal issue. But only when Yahshua ushers in his glorious kingdom will there be an end to death and every other evil on this earth. Revelation chapter 21 verse 3 reads, And I heard a great voice out of heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of Elohim is with men, and he will dwell with them, and they shall be his people, and Elohim himself shall be with them, and be their Elohim. And Elohim shall wipe away all tears from their eyes, and there shall be no more death, neither sorrow nor crying, neither shall there be any more pain, for the former things are passed away. This world has built in pain and suffering, which will not be alleviated until the kingdom is imposed and sin is a thing of the past. But because sin is still ruling on this earth, we will continue to suffer its consequences. The Apostle Paul endured many hardships, which are listed in several places in his letters. Why was the most influential apostle of the New Testament granted unlimited prosperity, wealth, and perpetually perfect health. He wrote in Philippians 4, 12 to 13, Not that I speak in respect of want, for I have learned in whatsoever state I am therewith to be content. I know both to be abased and to know how to abound. Everywhere and in all things I am instructed both to be full and to be hungry both to abound and to suffer need. I can do all things through Messiah, which strengthens me. But if we are living for the sake of the kingdom, wealth should not concern us at all. Wealth, as we know, drives us away from Yahweh, not toward Him. Revelation chapter 3, verse 17 says, Because you say I am rich and increased with goods and have need of nothing, and know not that you are wretched and miserable and poor and blind and naked. You see, worldly riches leave you empty spiritually because they cause you to rely on yourself. They really are a curse in many ways. Then we continue. I counsel you to buy of me gold tried in the fire, that you may be rich, and white raiment, that you may be clothed, and that the shame of your nakedness do not appear, and anoint your eyes with eye salve, that you may see. As many as I love, I rebuke and chasten, be zealous therefore, and repent. Gold tried in the fire is overcoming sin by the obedience that comes from faith. He says you need to see spiritually, not physically or carnally. He says he chastens those he loves, not showers them with riches and prosperity. Why would he heap upon you what will cause you to drive you from him? Let's be honest. The prosperity doctrine is widely preached because it is popular. It brings in numbers. But so do sports and Hollywood, and they have nothing to do with the scriptures either. It appeals to a generation who grew up in the 80s and played the stock market in the 90s, and this kind of preaching can become a habit if it means bigger crowds and bigger churches. It certainly promotes enthusiasm, but enthusiasm for personal gain is nothing but mere greed. This doctrine conflicts with the command and with the examples of the word. But the prosperity doctrine is popular because it appeals to the inner desires of the carnal spirit. Paul told Timothy in 2 Timothy 4 verses 3 to 4, For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine. But after their own lusts shall they heap to themselves teachers having itching ears. And they shall turn away their ears from the truth, 
and shall be turned unto fables. People mistake life now in a sinful world with a kingdom life to come. They think the kingdom is here, and therefore its blessings should be everywhere. The fact is the kingdom is not here yet, and certainly its blessings are not either. The kingdom awaits the return of Yahshua as king. Things are certainly going to get worse. Just read the headlines and see how bad they are now. It is Satan's rule. If the kingdom were here, we would expect our world to be getting better, safer, happier. Instead, we see the opposite. Yahshua said in John 16, 20, uh, 33, These things I have spoken unto you, that in me you might have peace. In the world you shall have tribulation, but be of good cheer, I have overcome the world. In Luke 6, 22, our Savior blows the whole prosperity doctrine clear out of the water when He says, Blessed are you when men shall hate you, and when they shall separate you from their company, and shall reproach you and cast out your name as evil for the Son of Man's sake. He says, Rejoice in that day, and leap for joy, for behold, your reward is great in heaven. For in like manner did their fathers unto the prophets, but woe unto you that are rich, for you have received your consolation. Woe unto you that are full, for you shall hunger, he says. Woe unto you that laugh now, for you shall mourn and weep. We've just run out of time. We ask that you join us again next time for more Discover the Truth. And we'll talk about another subject we think you'll find fascinating and right from the word of truth. For the free literature offered on today's program, write to Yahweh's Restoration Ministry, care of Discover the Truth, P.O. Box 463, Holt Summit, Missouri 65043. You can phone in your request to area code 573-896-9248. Don't forget to ask the operator about obtaining a free MP3 CD, which contains numerous sermons on many different topics. You can also visit our website at www.yrm.org for extensive study articles and online offers for free literature, CDs, and DVDs. We thank you for watching today. Join us again next week and discover the truth at this same time and station.